different to be on the other side. Yeah. I wonder this is how like uh, death is like, right? When you're on the other side looking around at life. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Roshi for this beautiful opportunity. I feel so honored and humbled to be given this platform uh, to share the Dhamma. So it's just unbelievable. I never thought I would have uh, been doing this here, you know, never in my wildest dreams, but this is my karma, so here I am. And in um, our tradition, we always start off by paying respects uh, to the Buddha uh, before we start, and I would like to share that with you. So I'll pay respects three times to the Buddha, I'll tell you what that means, and all you have to do is put your hands in gusho, okay? Namo tase bhagavato arehato Sama Sambuddhase Namo Tase Bhagavato Arehato Sama Sambuddhase Namo Tase Bhagavato Arehato Sama Sambuddhase. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the fully self awakened one. That's what it means. Some of you that know Sanskrit probably figured that out. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if you've heard this saying, uh, I usually hear it coming from like the Tibetan side, but I've also heard it in, in some Zen circles, which is uh, the Dharma, Buddhism is like a bird with two wings, right? The wing, one wing is the wing of compassion and the other one of wisdom. Right? And we need these two things in order to be able to live the Dhamma, practice the Dhamma, and get the fruits of the Dhamma. Then, as a Theravada monk, I was thinking, you know, I don't think they just made this up. You know, like, I don't think they just made this up. So reading through the suttas over and over and over and over again, and, you know, I wasn't only looking for this thing, but just reading through them, reading through them, I was like, there has to be some origin within the early Buddhist texts um, uh, for this to arise. And about like almost two years ago, I just stumbled upon it. I was just going through random suttas and the numerical discourses, the Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Fours. Uh, this sutta is one, uh, 186, I believe. Yeah, 186 in the in Book of Fours. So there's going to be four teachings, right? So it's all numbered. Buddhist love list, as we've all come to know already. Um, so yeah, wisdom and, com uh, wisdom and compassion, the two wings of this bird. We don't have such a simile. I haven't seen it in the suttas, but I was able to find these two things in a sutta. 
So there's this sutta, which I told you about Anguttara num number 4, uh, 186, called Umaga. Umaga means like a path, like a direction, like Marga in Sanskrit. Uma umaga, like a particular type of path. And in this discourse, um, there's a conversation between the Buddha, the historical Buddha, Samasambuddha Gautama, and one of the monks, one of the mendicants. And uh, this mendicant just comes up to the Buddha and asks a question. That's what everyone used to do uh, to the Buddha in those days. Buddha didn't get no breaks, you know? <laughs> there was no appointments for the Buddha. Buddha would just be chilling, and then people would come up and, you know, I have a question, right? Very Zen too, right? Like kind of jumping in there and just saying something, you know? Sometimes the Buddha was like trying to get food, trying to eat, trying to sleep, trying to do other things, and people would just come up and rush him and ask a question. Yeah. Um, so in, in this discourse, uh, the monk starts off with his first question. He says, in Pali, it says, Bhante. Some of you know me like that. We can talk about that later, why we share the same name, Bhante. Uh, he says, Bhante. What leads the world? What drags the world around? And what arises and controls the world? And the Buddha's like so compassionate, you know, he goes, Sadhu, Sadhu, monk. You've heard Sadhu before, right? It means like excellent or marvelous. He goes, that is a great question. You posed it correctly and you said it so nicely. I'll tell you what uh, leads the world drags the world around, what arises and controls the world. He says, bhikkhu, mendicant, it is the mind that leads the world. It is the mind that drags the world around. Haven't you noticed when you're sitting, how it drags your world around? <laughs> and it is the mind that arises and controls the world. You have to understand this. This is the first question. The first two questions have really nothing to do with the wisdom and compassion, but I want to go through the whole thing because they're still very nice questions, very important. So um, this, ver this, this kind of uh, idea of the importance of the mind is everywhere, you know? That's why there's these whole questions, is Buddhism really a religion? Is it a philosophy? Is it a psychology? All these things because there's just so much emphasis on the mind. And I don't know if some of you are familiar with the Dhammapada, the Dharmapada, right? There's over like 400 something verses in there. I don't remember. I had to memorize them a long time ago. Now I just like put them to the side, like dump them. Like when you're studying for school, you just get the information, pass the test, and you're like, okay, put it to the side. So I don't remember all of them. But the first two, you know, we could have, the Buddha could have started or the monks could have organized this collection in any way. But the first two verses here talk about this. Mano pupangam madamma mano setta mano maya. What does that mean? Mind is the forerunner. Mind is the creator, right? Mind is the most important thing. Then the Buddha goes on. Uh, whatever one thinks, for the good or the bad, that will be their experience. That will be their world. That will be their life. If you think in an unwholesome way, in a bad way, he says, you're going to be like an ox or a bull that's tied to a cart with all this heavy weight, just dragging yourself around life, around the world, right? Because the mind drags the world around, as I told you in the Umaga Sutta. But then he says also, if one thinks wholesome thoughts, happy thoughts, good thoughts, beneficial thoughts, skillful thoughts, then you walk, you walk around the world only carrying your shadow. I've never gotten tired from carrying my shadow. It's very light, right? So here we see this importance of the mind that the Buddha gives, right? What we think. But also I want to kind of dig a little deeper into this because we have a tendency when we hear the word think or mind, we think like words, right? Oh, thinking means words, like the intellectual part. But thinking also means emotion. Thinking means images. Thinking means sounds. All these things, is th these, these are all cognitions. They're all thoughts. So whatever object of mind you entertain, if that object is skillful or unskillful, your mind will continue that way, right? Because we might 
maybe not think bad thoughts like intellectual thoughts. You may have a very good stories that you tell yourself, but you might entertain very bad images, right? Like fantasies or revenge plots or, right? They may not be like uh, words that you're saying in your, in your mind, but the, the picture's playing out, right? Or you might entertain certain emotions, right? Even though you don't tell yourself a story or you don't, there's not a real going on in your mind, that's still a thought. So we have to be careful what we entertain. So then this monk's very pleased. Oh, thank you, Bhante, thank you. That's a great answer. But I got another question for you, Buddha. Right? He says, they say some people are very learned. What does this mean that someone's very learned? The Buddha again praises this monk. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu bhikkhu. Very, very good. Excellent, excellent monk. Great mendicant. That's a great question that you asked me. Now I'm going to tell you, he says, I've told many stories, given many lectures, talked about past lives, talked about future things that are going to happen. And he goes through a whole list of poems, songs, lists. I have taught in all these ways. But if someone, some of you might recognize this, but if someone were to only memorize four lines of any of these things, they can be considered a learned person. Right? That's like something that you see a lot, like in Mahayana Sutras, right? You don't see that much in Theravada, but it's there. So we're getting there. We're getting to the synthesis of putting both of the things together. How does this all fit together? So the monk's very happy. Great, 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 great. This is a, this is a very good answer. Now we're going to get to the topic today of the wings, the wings of Dhamma, the wings of Buddhism, uh, compassion and wisdom. And he says, Bhante, I have another question for you. He says, go ahead. Then the monk says, uh, who is a person who is learned in penetrative wisdom? Uh, learned here, they use suttava. I just want to be clear because they changed. Learned doesn't, it's not always the same word. Here, suttava means someone who listens. In those days, there wasn't any book. So if you want to be learned, you had to listen, right? So people would just drop into all these lectures or just listen to the monk's talk or the Buddha talk or all these different uh, religious teachers talking. So a learned person was someone who heard a lot, who listened a lot. I think we're kind of getting there now with like podcasts, right? That's what kind of what we're doing. We're like going back to like learning a lot through listening instead of like reading. I don't think that many people read anymore. Um, so who is a person who is very learned in penetrative wisdom? Penetrative wisdom, nibideka panyo. Panyo is prajna. Panya prajna, right? Wisdom. And Nibideka means piercing, penetrating, like Manjushri over here with the sword, right? Cutting through. What is that type of wisdom? It's going to be no surprise to you here. The Buddha says, uh, one uh, who has listened to or learned what is Dukkha, suffering. That person is a learned person in penetrative wisdom, piercing wisdom. One who has learned about uh, Dukkha Samudaya, the arising, the cause, the origin of Dukkha, of suffering. That person can be considered a learned person in penetrative wisdom. One who has learned, who has studied, who has listened to uh, uh, Dukkha Niroda, the cessation of suffering, freedom from suffering the turning off of suffering. Someone who has studied this can also be considered a learned person in penetrative wisdom. And one who has learned, listened to, etc. cetera, uh, Dukkha Nirodo Gamini Patipadda. Break it down for you. <laughs> Dukkha, suffering, Nirodo, cessation, Gamini, leading, Patipadda, path. One who has studied the path to the cessation of suffering. One who's done this, who has learned this, that person can also be considered a learned person uh, in penetrative wisdom. So, going back to the two wings of wisdom and compassion of this bird, this would fall under wisdom, proper wisdom, prajna, the one wing, four noble truths. What else will we have here? Paticca samupada, praticca samupada, right? The 12 steps of dependent origination. That's another way that we can understand it. How else can we understand it? We can understand it by 
the clinging or the attachment to the five skandhas. That's also penetrative wisdom. Also, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, uh, suffering, and non-self. That's also penetrative wisdom. So within this wisdom wing, we have all of these more philosophical, you know, more scholarly or more mystical, contemplative kind of aspect uh, uh, to the practice. So the monk's very satisfied. Oh, thank you, Bhante. That was a very, very good answer. I'm so happy that you shared that with me. But I still have another question for you. You know, they talk about uh, a learned person in vast or great wisdom. Who is the learned person in vast slash great wisdom? So here they use, uh, for learned, they use pandito, like a pandita or a pandit, someone who's like a scholar, you know? And uh, for this great wisdom, they use something very similar. Maybe you can catch it, even if I say it in Pali. Maha panya. Maha prajna. Sound familiar, right? Maha prajna. What is maha prajna? Right? Who is a person who is a, a pundit, a scholarly person, a learned person in Mahaprasna? The Buddha says, Sadhu, Sadhu, Bhikkhu. Excellent, excellent. Another great question. I love how you pose that question. I'm going to give you the answer. A person who does not harm themselves, a person who does not harm another, a person who doesn't harm anyone at all, a person who works for the benefit of oneself, a person who works for the benefit of others, a person who works for the benefit of all, that person is considered a learned person in Mahaprajna. When I saw that, I was like, wow, Mahaprajna is compassion, right? Mahaprajna Paramita, what does that mean? The perfection of vast or great wisdom. What is this great wisdom, at least according to this particular discourse? Compassion, loving kindness, altruistic joy, equanimity, the Brahma Viharas, right? Compassion doesn't come by itself. Some, when, in Mahayana, from my understanding, when we talk about compassion, it includes all the Brahma Viharas. And in Theravada, when we talk about loving kindness, metta, it also includes all of them, you know? We just have like different things that we emphasize to start or different entrances, different Dharma gates to get into that. Uh, divine dwelling of the Brahma Viharas. So when I was reading the sutta, I was like, finally, like here it is. We have the vast wisdom and the penetrative wisdom. But here's something interesting. They're both wisdom, right? The Nibhideka, the penetrative wisdom, is wisdom. And also this uh, Maha, Maha Prajna, Maha Panya, compassion is wisdom. So I was thinking, this bird doesn't have two wings, right? <laughs> This bird just like hovers like a UFO. Because uh, there's only wisdom. One wing is the penetrative wisdom. The other wing is the vast wisdom. There's only wisdom, right? So, uh, so to be a compassionate person means to be a wise person. That is wisdom. Compassion is wisdom, right? It's not, it's not just that uh, without wisdom, you can't have compassion. Without compassion, you can't have wisdom. But actually... Compassion is wisdom, and wisdom is compassion, right? But for us, in this, as they say in, in some suttas, the Buddha needs to kind of dumb it down, you know? So we kind of get these kind of like uh, divisions. First, they might tell you like, okay, compassion and wisdom, but it's basically the same thing. I want to tie this back to the, to the first answer that the Buddha gave of the Four Noble Truths. Right within these Four Noble Truths, we have wisdom and compassion. To, to even entertain the idea that you can be free from suffering, that you deserve to be free from suffering, that you can have happiness and you deserve to be happy, that is a compassionate thought. That is a, if you can do that, you're a very wise person too. Right? So you, will, you would be considered both a learned person in the sense of the Four Noble Truths, um, and a learned person in the sense of the vast and great compassionate wisdom. That's just amazing to me, you know, I, 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 how the Four Noble Truths, at least, you know, even from where I 
uh, from my teachers and the books that I've read within my tradition, I don't really see the emphasis of compassion in the Four Noble Truths, right? It kind of just seems like a big downer, like the world sucks. That's what basically it sounds like to us, right? Dukkha, dukkha, dukkha. There's four dukkhas in there, <laughs> right? Like it really, really, really sucks. Like it's really bad. It's, the world's really bad. But no, it's actually, it's the good word. It's, it's the good message, right? That we can be free from suffering. And that there's a way to get there. But it's not, only, it's not only for ourselves, although that might be the critique from other schools about Theravada, <laughs> that it's only for ourselves. Um, we recognize that as I am, so are they. As they are, so am I. Right? I, sh I, I don't harm myself. I don't harm others. I don't harm myself and others. That's everyone. I do what's beneficial for myself, beneficial for others, beneficial for all. That's all beings. So if they're suffering, that means... I work towards not only reducing my own suffering, but that of others. And not only others and not myself, but including myself, right? All of us together. Sometimes when we think about compassion, it's very outward driven, right? It means for other people. We say all beings. And I think one of the uh, Teachers, a few weeks ago, I don't remember exactly when, they said, no, that means us too. We are all beings. We're one of those beings. Sabesata, bhavantu sukitata, sabesata, all beings, right? Deserve to be well. All beings uh, deserve to be happy. That means us. There isn't only being compassionate towards others. There's being compassionate towards yourself. And then one that, you know, at times I found very difficult is... Uh, Receiving compassion from others, right? <laughs> like, oh yeah, I should be happy. Others should be happy. And then when other people, someone else tries to help me, oh no, no, I got it. I'm good. You know, oh, it's okay. You know, I don't want to bother you. That's not very compassionate to towards myself, right? It's hard to accept compassion. So with, within the Four Noble Truths, we have these two wings of wisdom and compassion. And I really want to deep dig deeper into this Mahaprajna or Mahapanya. This is based, this understanding of not wanting to hurt oneself, not wanting to hurt others, not wanting to hurt any being, and to do what's beneficial for oneself, to do what's beneficial for others, and to do what's beneficial for all, is based on this, this little phrase that I gave you, and the Buddha repeats over and over and over again in the suttas, as I am, so are they. As they are, so am I. Then he says, taking this into consideration, one shouldn't harm or tell another to harm any living being. So I found this very interesting that to begin this practice, you have to step out of yourself. You have to be able to empathize, right? You have to stop being egocentric and actually look out at other beings and see how they're like you. I don't like to get sick. I don't think other beings like to get sick, except for like elementary school kids. They love getting sick, right? Because they don't have to go to school. But besides them, that's the one exception. No one likes to get sick. No one likes to get old, except for teenagers, because they want their driver's license, they want to be 18 so they can move out, and they want to get drunk or whatever. That one exception to the side, no one else wants to get old right? And nobody wants to die, right? I don't got a joke for that one. I think that one's a very serious matter. That's why every night, right? Life and death is of supreme importance. No, because no one wants to die. Don't waste your time, right? It's not only me who doesn't like these things. I know my sister, my mom, the other monks, many of you, most beings. The Buddha says all beings tremble when they're being attacked. All beings tremble. Here's something very interesting. The word karuna is actually not very close to our word in English, compassion. There is a word in Pali that's very close to compassion. And we have to say it when we get our ordination. It's called anukampa. It means to tremble with. Right? Your pain is my pain. I feel that pain. I resonate with it. To tremble with anukampa. 
So when I, be, when I became a monk and I took my ordination, I said, Bhante, out of compassion, please give me the ordination, right? He had to resonate with my, with, with my pain. The monk had to be compassionate. He had to understand dukkha in order, for me, in order for him to understand why I was taking this, right? Why I was taking this vow. So it's very interesting that even within, you know, my tradition, <laughs> the path to renunciation, the path to becoming a, a monk, I mean, you, you literally have to ask for the compassion of another being. Compassion is right in there. You know, it's weaved in there. And that word is very, very close to our compassion. Where actually karuna is, very, is a lot closer to kindness, to be kind. Because the opposite of uh, karuna is, is to harm, to hurt other living beings. So what would be the opposite of like doing a harmful action? Well, to be doing a kind action, a beneficial action, right? To help others. That's why um, Bhante Gutnaratna uh, from the Bhavana Society, he talks about that he doesn't like using loving kindness, you know, for, for Maitri, for Metta. He's like, because we already have kindness in the next one. And compassion, well, we already have the word anukampa for compassion. And loving kindness kind of feels weird. Like who, who has ever just felt loving kindness on its own, right? We know love and we know kindness. Loving kindness is kind of a weird concept, right? But anyways, I'm going into some rant about <laughs> definitions and etymology. Some people here might know that that's a habit that I have, uh, Sankara. I'm trying to get over that Sankara. Luckily enough, that Sankara is also impermanent. So at some point, I'll get over it. Uh, so I want to focus on these Brahma Viharas. Brahma, because compassion, we're talking about the wing of compassion. That's what I want to focus on, Mahaprajna. Uh, starts with Maitri, which in Pali we call Metta. Metta means that you recognize that in the same way that I want to be well, happy, comfortable, and peaceful, etc., etc., other beings also want that. Right? So may they be happy. That is what Maitri means. That's what we usually translate as loving kindness. Recognizing that other beings are actually alive. There's someone in there. There's something going on, and that they want to be happy, that the world is not just about me. That is the meaning of, the, of Maitri, of Metta, the first Brahma Vihara. Not putting your happiness above others. Also, not putting other people's happiness above your own. Everyone's happiness is equal, of equal value. Because there's many traps there, right? Like, oh, I should be happy. Who cares about the rest? Or everyone else should be happy. I'm, un I'm unworthy. I'm a bad person. No, no, no. True happiness is when everyone's happy. That's the only happiness there is. Then we have um, karuna, which is the same in Pali and Sanskrit, so that works out really nice. Uh, and that is the wish that other beings be free from suffering. Right? That's actually the wish that other beings may be happy. They might be experiencing pain right now, but you have this intention that they, they will be able to overcome their pain. And my teacher used to talk about it like this. He used to say, um, there's two types of doctors. One's that, one that, because he was a doctor before, uh, there's two types of doctor. One that sees the patient as sick or pathologizes the patient. And the other one that sees the innate ability for the patient's own body to heal itself. So the person might be in pain, but they focus on the strengths within that body to overcome that illness. That is what karuna is. Yes, you're sick. Yes, you're in pain. You're suffering. But there is that potential of awakening in you. And that potential of awakening is happiness, sukha, to be free from pain. Somebody keep track of time. I have no idea what time it is. Someone just give me a sign. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay. I'll just, I'll go all night um, talking about the Buddha. Uh, so that's karuna, right? Then we have mudita, usually translated as sympathetic joy. But there's nothing about sympathetic in that word. Literally, mudita means joy. It just means joy, gladness, to be happy, right? Then when, when we look at this, what kind of happiness is this? It's a happiness that is free from jealousy and resentment, right? 
we, when we see other people happy, we just become happy. We don't start analyzing if they deserve to be happy. Or you may know, you may think that they don't deserve to be happy, right? Like your coworker or your boss, they get a promotion or something good happens and you're like, oh, they don't deserve it, you know? You should be happy that they're happy, right? Because at least I hope when they're happy, they'll be less of a jerk at that time. So it's good for you that they're happy, right? It's only when they're miserable that they're going to pass that misery on to you. So mudita is that ability to be happy for others, regardless of whatever's going on. I'm glad that you're glad. That's good. I don't start trying to analyze the situation, whether you deserve it or not, or what you did to me or did to others. No, you're happy. That's good, because all beings deserve to be happy. You're happy now, and you weren't before. There's a compassion, right? And now you are happy. Oh, my wish of compassion has been realized. Now you're happy. You're always a jerk to me. My boss is always a jerk. But now you're happy. So the compassionate aspiration worked out. That's mudita. Literally means joy. Upeka, usually translated as equanimity. This is the roughest one <laughs> to like translate. It literally means to like look upon. That's what it means. But to look upon without being phased, right? Without being afflicted. You have enough space to hold all the pain, yours, others, and the whole world, right? And to be that, that anchor or, or that sense of being grounded for others and for yourself and for all beings. We need that too. That's a compassionate action. That's an action of kindness. You know, I remember many times in my life where I've looked to someone to be that for me, that pillar, right? I didn't want them to commiserate with me and start getting all sad with me. I didn't need that, right? And I didn't need a positive person. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. I just needed someone to be there and look and witness, right? And not be, not see like any sense of disgust or, or any kind of, you know, something that would turn me off or disconnect me from them, right? Just someone to witness. That's a powerful thing, Upeka, just to see things Clearly, actually, upeka can also mean to see things clearly, like vipassana. Vipassana and upeka are very close. Vipassana is the nearest uh, condition uh, uh, to, uh, leading to the, that leads to uh, vipassana, seeing things clearly. But I don't want to go into that. <laughs> we'll stay with, the, with this loving kindness, uh, Mahaprajna. So, here's, here's a very, very, uh, like, interesting uh, thing about these two wings of compassion, loving kindness, uh, Mahaprajna and penetrative wisdom, uh, the four noble truths, is that I'm going to be a little, uh, what, do you, what do you call those people? Apologetic. <laughs> Apologetic for the Theravada position <laughs> right here. Uh, you know, The Theravada monks also are very much concerned for the well-being of others. You know, we do have this aspiration for all beings to be free from suffering. We want, we want that to happen. It's there all over the suttas. But, I, you know, for some reason, it's not being shared enough, right? And I think, you know, our side it plays very much into this kind of like solitary, ascetic, running away from the world, doing my own thing, meditating in a little hut, you know, looking out for my own liberation. But there is no liberation without others. There isn't. There isn't. Even when you look at the time of the Buddha, the Buddha became awakened, then five beings became awakened, then thousands of beings became awakened, then thousands and thousands of palm beings became awakened. When one being wakes up, it leads to this kind of like domino effect of all beings uh, waking up. So even if one comes from this position of like, I am going to wake up, even if you, your intention is kind of um, egocentric, if you do get any fruits from that practice, there will be ripples from that. If you stop hurting living beings, right? If you refrain from killing, other beings will be happy. They don't have to fear you. They're free from fear. Right? And having that condition to be free from fear, that condition of being happy, of not worrying about being killed, is a very good condition for awakening. Everything that happens, happens due to the presence of the necessary conditions, cause and effect. 
we need to create the conditions for awakening. One way to create the conditions of, for awakening is to stop being violent in body, speech, and mind. So even if you take on the precepts for a very selfish way, I know when I first came to this practice, it was all about all my drama, all my sadness, all my pain. I wanted to be free from it. Yeah, I know other people, people had pain, but my pain, you know, you really feel it. I really feel my pain. I wanted to be free from it. But I noticed, like, especially with my family, when I was... Thanks to the Dhamma, when I was practicing the Dhamma, this pain started finding its place and kind of started uh, being calm and more subtle. There was ripple effects throughout my whole family. You know, I stopped being less of a jerk, less isolated. People were like my mom. All moms are happy to see their kids happy. So I was less of a jerk. I was more happy. My mom was automatically happy too, you know? So sometimes we miss these kind of like little subtleties of the practice of compassion. We think compassion means to be like a member of the Justice League or, right, like the Avengers or something like that. If I'm that person or if I'm the Buddha, then I'm a compassionate being, you know, but if I'm just at home, then I guess, or just being nice to my family, then I'm not really compassionate. No, that, that is compassion. There, compassion in any form is compassion and 100% compassion in, in every way, even just thinking the thoughts. Remember the beginning about the thoughts, about how the mind is dragged around? Having a thought of compassion is compassion, 100% compassion in that thought. You know, it's not any less than a word of compassion or, a, or an action of compassion. It's the same, you know, but it's only to us because we're so um, fixed on outcomes, you know? We want things to be our way, even when it comes to compassion. That, that in some way we turn that into like, well, my, my compassion isn't really that compassionate. Well, I'm not really practicing compassion, right? So instead of practicing compassion, you practice the opposite. You're, you become violent towards yourself. You start hurting yourself. But the Buddha said, no, no, no. You cannot hurt yourself. You cannot hurt yourself. You cannot hurt others. And you cannot hurt yourself and others, right? So I'm going to come back now to the, this discourse that I was sharing with you, the Umaga Sutta, the path, the particular path with this monk. And I remember one monk, he's a very funny monk, unfortunately he passed away a couple of years. He told me, that you got three steps to do when you give a Dhamma talk. Tell them what you're going to tell them, right? Tell them then, and then tell, tell them what you told them. It's got to be three times, right? And I was like, wow, that's just like Buddhism, right? Like we do everything three times. I was like, oh, this monk really embodied that, that teaching. So I told you what I was going to talk about. Then I talked about it. Now I'm going to tell you what I already told you. All right? <laughs> so there was this monk. He had questions of the Buddha. Bhante, you know, what is it that leads the world? What is it that drags the world around? What arises and controls the world? It is the mind that leads the world. It is the mind that drags the world around. It is the mind that arises and controls the world. Bhante, who is a learned person? How can someone be considered... Uh, a learned person. If someone were just to know at least four lines of any of my teachings, you could consider that person a learned person. But Bhante, who is a person who is learned in penetrative wisdom? A person who knows suffering, the cause of suffering, freedom from suffering, and the path leading freedom from suffering. That person is considered a learned person in penetrative wisdom. But Bhante, who is a person who is considered a learned person in vast, great wisdom? It is a person who doesn't hurt themselves, doesn't hurt others, doesn't hurt any being, does what's beneficial for oneself, for others, and for all beings. This is a person who has vast wisdom, great wisdom. And at that, the monk, I think his name was Badaka, Badaka uh, was satisfied and content. And that's how most of the suttas and all the monks are happy. There's one sutta where the monks are not happy. And that's because the Buddha rebukes them. And he's like, no, 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 naughty, naughty monks. And they're not, they're not happy with that. But all the other times, except for that one, they're all happy with what the Buddha said. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's pretty much what I had today. I don't know where we're at on time. 25? Good? Awesome. Okay. Uh, 
I'm not really good with the form still. I'm always on that side, so I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing on this side. So I'll leave it to everyone in charge to keep the wheels moving. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's do questions. Yeah, that's fine. I just had one quick one. The four lines, any four lines? Yeah. Are there pretty... Any four lines of the, either his songs, his verse, his lectures, his list, his Jataka stories, um, and all of that. If you know any of those four lines, you're considered a, a learned person. It says, Dhamma, Dhamma Darato, uh, in the teachings of the, of the Dharma, a learned person in the teachings of the Dharma. If you know the Four Noble Truths, it takes care of number two and three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to essence, to essence, yeah. right? Just <laughs> Anybody else? In studio audience? <clears throat> so when we, uh, <clears throat> we mentioned the mind, mm -hmm. um, where does like a tree or a rock play into that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so so like mm -hmm. for example you mentioned the mind is emotions thoughts mm -hmm. right all, all mm -hmm. the kind of phenomena that happens in my experience and then something like a tree or a rock like something of more uh maybe a subtle manifestation or something similar mm -hmm. kind of how does that play in yeah uh so you're you're kind of saying like what what does it mean to like if you have a thought of a tree or of a rock? Uh, no, it's more like, um, you know, right, what drags the world around, what, mm -hmm. and the other ones that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, right? So then there's the more other, the other life forms, essentially, maybe mm -hmm. not a rock, uh, depending how you look mm -hmm. at things, but let's, we'll say a tree. Um, you know, they also have an impact on the world in the ways in which things mm. are shaped, right? So, mm. yeah. Yeah, here I'll have to like um, touch upon a point that is um, kind of given from the from the sutta perspective, the early uh, text is that the Buddha has this one discourse where he says the world, no, the beginning of the world, the world and the path leading to the end of the world is in this fathom long body with its uh, perceptions and conceptions, right? Other beings, trees, they're just experiences or thoughts, you know? So we're very generous in that we, we make an inference that, okay, I may not able to be a step out of my mind, but I'm going to live as though there are real beings on the other side. You know? So all, these, all we know are just objects of the mind. To be able to know anything else, you'd have to step out of your mind, but then you'd probably just end up in another mind, and you'd always be stuck. We're always stuck in this phenomenal world. We can't escape it. But... You know, in our culture, we take, it, we take it as a given that there is like a subjective, objective world or material and a subjective experience or phenomena and phenomena. But in the, like, at least from many Buddhist perspectives, uh, these are all just phenomena of the mind. These are just experiences. And yes, all experiences do have an impact uh, on your mind, even just looking at a white wall or anything. Everything, every single experience, every single thought, every sensation, every perception, every feeling, Everything matters, you know? Thank you. So in the beginning, you said you would explain Bhante, Bhante. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, keeping me to my word. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, according to the, to, According to the Pali Suttas, um, during the time of the Buddha, only one being was referred to as Bhante, and that was the Samasambuddha Gautama. And all the monks would refer to themselves as, to each other as Avuso. Avuso means friend. But in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, in the last weeks of the Buddha's life, when the Buddha is about to pass away, he's laying on his side. He says, uh, after my passing away, the monks will no longer refer to each other as friends. The junior monks will call the senior monks Bhante. And the senior monks will call the junior monks Avuso, friend. So from that time on, supposedly according to the tradition for the last 2,500 years, you know, the senior monks, where's Shimyu? Oh, she's in the kitchen, huh? 
she always laughs about this. The senior monks are called Vante. So when, a Vante is a senior monk, right? So when you say Vante, my name means like senior monk. Uh, but Vante is used as like reverend or venerable, right? As an honorary uh, kind of like uh, title also. So that's what Vante means. But like scholars are like, no, it couldn't have been possible that during the time of the Buddha, this word Bhante was there. They think it came from like the head chanter. So the, per the monk who was leading the chant, they were called Bhante. It comes from like a word called, I think, Banaka or something like that. I don't remember right now, but they think there's where it came. And then they just added that. They gave that title to the Buddha like after, once they were writing the suttas, you know, that's like the academic perspective of it. So, you know, make of it what you want. <laughs> yeah, that's where Bhante comes from. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, dedication of merit? Got time? Yeah, all right. <laughs> dedication of merit, okay. So by coming here and listening to the Dhamma talk, you have developed many skillful states of mind. Uh, kusala Dhamma, which is also a skillful action by thinking about them. Uh, kusala Kamma, and these skillful states of mind result in merit, punya, which is called punya kamma, meritorious deeds. So by the power of these meritorious actions, May you be free from bad company and always have good companions until you attain Nibbana. Now we'll do the formal Pali. Imina punya kamena mame bala samagamo satam samage mohotu yaveni bana patiya Sadhu, 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 anumudami. That means rejoice, be happy, because Buddhism is about being happy, not about being sad and suffering. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs>